to bring us more together. I mean, it's it's Bokia Tov for some of you. Good morning. It's Saharayim Tovim for others. Good, good afternoon. And yet for others, it's beginning to become evening. So I'll say uh, Erev Tov and also Chodesh Tov, uh, Shavua Tov, a good week, a good month. Uh, what I'd like to do to begin, like as a beginning bookend, to welcome you into the Pardes community that I am blessed to be a part of is I'd like us to breathe, to take three, to receive, to hold and return three focused breaths together. When we breathe together, we become more present because we can only breathe in the present. We can't breathe a minute ago and we can't breathe a minute from now until it happens. And I'm one of those people who I, at Pardes and elsewhere applied Jewish, applied Jewish spirituality and other venues, I teach to Judaism being a spiritual practice. Yes, it's a religion. Yes, it's a, it's a culture. Yes, it's a, we're a tribe. We have a whole history. I teach those specifically texts that are really address and talk to encountering the soul within. So part of doing that involves connection, connection within oneself and connection with others. And being that this is a virtual room, we're up to 25 people now, so if anyone else enters, we'll move to another screen. I really don't see all of you, or I'm not with all of you, obviously, physically, but if we breathe together, there's a sense of just feeling more present with ourselves and with each other. So let's do that. It basically, it's just breathing. And see breathing as, well, I'm, rather than, well, I'm breathing anyway, see it as a moment of a sacred practice. We are actively receiving the gift of life. We're holding it and admiring with gratitude. And then we gently return it. And we'll do that three times together. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that practice with me. I see someone chatted in. Okay, it's all good. No worries. <clears throat> so seeing Judaism through the lens of a spiritual practice, I'm going to share with you a teaching from the Bahatanya, Rabbi Shmir Zalman of La'adi, also known as the Alta Rabbi, who published his first book called Tanya in 1796 in the Ukraine. He was one of the earlier classic, the generation of classic Rebbe's who learned from the Magid of Mezerich, who learned from the Baal Shem Tov. So in this chapter, chapter 47, the Alta Rebbe discusses <clears throat> that the great love showered by God on B'nai Israel when he took us out of Egypt and led us to his innermost chambers by giving us the Torah and mitzvot, whereby we were able to attach ourselves to him, her, it, with the ultimate level of unity is not only historical. We too, everyone in this Zoom room, we too today can expect to encounter, to feel, to sense this type of divine love to be shown to us as well as we today not only recall, but actually experience our own individual and spiritual exodus. Therefore, experiencing a connection, a connection with love and with closeness to the divine within each one of us. And part of the exercise of breathing, which we just did as a beginning bookend, is that breath in Hebrew is nishima and soul is nishama. So our very breathing infuses us with soul. 
from the very first moment that the Creator breathed into Adam and Chava the very first breath. Imagine what that was like to receive the very first breath. Well, every time we breathe, if we intend to receive, it's the first. And we, we are receiving soul. So what does that have to do with Pesach? What does that have to do with coming out of Mitzrayim, out of a personal, personal exodus? I want to also mention, I tend to use Hebrew as I move through the text. I don't know in the room who knows Hebrew, what level, if you do. So please, if I'm not translating or if there's a word, please, please, please stop me. It's much more important that we all understand this in English than just some of us understand this in Hebrew. And feel comfortable to stop me. Uh, and I will therefore and immediately provide the translation if I don't. Okay, so there's a phrase that we say at the Seder. And it's actually from the Mishnah. In Masachet, in Tractate Pesachim, chapter 10, the fifth Mishnah. And we, we, will, we shall repeat it in a couple of weeks at the Seder. In every generation, a person is obliged to regard oneself as if he or she had come out of Egypt. Now, I don't know how all of you feel when you hear that. For years, though, as much as I have been a student of text for over four decades, and I am constantly cultivating scholarship, I've learned to have a little bit of... Um, uh, as Rebbe Nachman of Breslev said, a little bit of chutzpah, as long as it's chutzpah of kedusha, to push back. And what does it mean I'm supposed to see me as if I have come out of Egypt? I thought that was a historical event. So the fact that we repeat this every year, it's not just a piece of Mishnah. It's not just part of the oral Torah. When we repeat it every year out of the Haggadah, it beckons, it, it behooves us, it, 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 it mamash compels us to ask the question, what does that even mean? And that's what this chapter of Tanya is all about. And the Bala Tanya is going to address that. So here we go. I'll start reading in Hebrew. You have the English there. Now, the, I want to caution you also that the English is not just the translation. There's a beautiful, inspiring, wonderful commentary in English. It initially was in Yiddish. It was translated in the 60s and 70s from Yiddish into Hebrew, and then from the rabbi's son, translating it into English. And it's from a book called Lessons in Tanya. You see it there in the introduction. Rabbi Yosef Weinberg, who was the original commentator, and then his son, Levi Weinberg, translated it in 1982 into English. It's a marvelous translation, which I will be referring to. Okay, and now the Balatanya adds his own phrase. Not only in each and every generation, but every single day. Each person is obligated to see oneself ki'ilu, so not only, it really strengthens the question, not only as the Mishnah states, and we repeat it in the Haggadah at the, at the Seder, not only am I expected because I'm part of this generation today, am I obligated to see me coming out as if I have come out of Egypt, but the Balatanya is saying every single day. How is that possible? Every day. So he continues. The he it's really the revelation, the manifestation, the awareness of one's own soul within becoming more revealed because the soul is covered over by the body. And there's a term from the Zohar in Aramaic, mashka dechivya. It literally means the serpent's skin. And just the way a serpent can shed the skin so we can shed, in terms of a consciousness, the skin that's covering, that's concealing our spirituality. 
Then once we become aware, then what happens? or Then we become included, we become absorbed, we become united with the source of our soul, which is the infinite. We become part of a greater light. Day, and how do we do that? It's not an out of the body experience. We stay here on the planet Earth. It's by learning Torah. When we observe the mitzvot, when we're learning Torah in the most general sense, but also particularly upafrat, bekabalat machut shemayim bekriyat shema. When we say the shema, for those who say it, some say it twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening. Some say it also before we go to sleep. What is it when we say shema? That's so important. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. By saying the Shema, the Balatanya is telling us that I am receiving upon me a reality of the unity of God, the God that is out there that created everything, the infinite, the transcendental aspect of God, and the peace of God that's in my soul is all the same. That awareness, that awareness is moving from a narrow consciousness to an expanded consciousness. I'm going to read the English. In every generation and every day, a person is obliged to regard himself as if he or she had that day come out of Egypt. This text is cited from the Mishnah, except that the Alta Rebbe, as I mentioned, inserts the words every day and that day, making it a spiritual practice. For the Exodus is not only an event which took place in every generation. It is also a daily event in the spiritual life, obviously not in historical, exact physical life, but in our spiritual life. This refers to the release of the divine soul, the coming out of the soul from being confined by the body, which is the serpent's skin. Meaning when we look at each other, what do we initially see? We see the external aspect. We see height, weight, hair color, stature. We don't see the soul, but the soul is there. The soul is behind. So we need to cultivate what's called by many of the Hasidic Rebbe's, a higher consciousness, which allows us to see behind the curtain what's really going on. This, in essence, is a coming out of Egypt because it's moving from, in Egypt, the Hebrew word is Mitzrayim, Mitzar is a narrow place. We're moving to an expanded place where we learn to see not only what is obvious and apparent, but what is more subtle. It's developing a sensitivity to that which is more subtle. The body is a source of confinement for the divine soul since it derives its life force from klipa, meaning klipa literally means it's a peel, it's a covering. It's like the, the, um, <clears throat> the shell of a, of a nut. Imagine the wa a walnut. So when you buy walnuts, you see the shell, but you're not buying it for the shell, you're buying it for the walnut. So you have to crack open the shell to get to the fruit. Similarly, it's like that here. It is from this exile that the divine soul goes forth in order to be absorbed into the unity of the light of the blessed Ein Sof. Engaging in the Torah, every time we learn Torah, what we're doing right now, our soul is becoming more manifest, more revealed. When we observe a mitzvah, and I'm not addressing the halachah or the legal, the external dimensions of, of observing a mitzvah, seeing a mitzvah as an opportunity to be close, to connect, to be absorbed and to become part of something much bigger than our finite bodies, to become part of something that's infinite. And that's why when we say, the Lord is our God, the, law, the Lord is one, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, our God, Adonai Echad, the Lord is one. So he continues that, and this is, he compares this to it being unlike the Avot and Imahot. What did our Avot and Imahot do? They had to work. 
through their faith, through their actions, they merited closeness. They merit a, merited a sense of unity with the divine spirit. But since the giving of the Torah, we have it as an inheritance. It's like a gift. Through the performance of the mitzvot, the same may be said of every Jew. Every, we're all on the same playing field, whether you're fluent in Hebrew, whether you're orthodox, conservative, reform, non-affiliated, living in Israel, chutz la'aretz, 80 years old, eight years old. Every, I, I like to say that God is the um, equal opportunity lover. He loves us all the same. He, she, it. God may rightfully be called our God. What do we say with the Shema? Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu, our God. For this is a heritage. This is a Yerusha. This is a gift, a matana, in that he has given us his Torah and has clothed in it his will and his wisdom. He has clothed in it with sono v'chokhmato, which are united with his essence and being in perfect unity. There is no separation because not only is God one with everything that God has created, God is, in, is completely at one with, one's, with himself, unlike, by the way, the human being. The Rambam, Maimonides, points out that the human being has three components. We are the knower. We possess the power of knowledge, it's called our brain, and we also can acquire that which is known. Hamada, Hayodea, Bahamuda, Hayadua. With God, it's all the same. So the will of God, the 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 uh, wisdom of God, it's all the same. It says in the Zohar uh, that the Kutsha Brichu, that the the Torah and God, the Holy One, Blessed Be, are the same. So through Torah study, and Pardes, by the way, I plug for Pardes, I couldn't think of a better place to reveal your soul. And I'm not saying this because I teach at Pardes. I teach at Pardes because of what I'm going to say. It, it's an amazing place to get a sense of your inner being through Talmud, through Chumash. And you know, there's a lot of reasons why a lot of people like Pardes. I'll say as a faculty member, I don't wanna to forget to say this. And as I get deeper into the text, I may, and I don't wanna forget. It's really, really important. Yes, it's diverse. Yes, it's not affiliated, because it's non-denominational. And I can go on and on with all the particulars, but as a faculty member, I'll tell you what I love about Pardes. Not every student who, who enrolls, enrolls in my class, but I know for sure Whatever classes that every student enrolls in, they will be taught by the most incredible caliber of faculty. I feel so humbled that I can call them my colleagues. Everyone teaches not only with a mastery of the material, but with passion. So when I teach chassidut and spiritual practice, I teach it with my passion. Those who teach Talmud, those who teach Chumash, those who teach the Jewish law, those who teach whatever, teach it with the same passion, with the same fluency. So it's such an honor, it's such an honor. When we are doing that in any of the classes, not only in the spiritual practice classes, when we are doing that, we are actually uniting our seichel, our intellect and our heart, our emotions with God. Since his wisdom and will are one with him, so his Torah, when we study God's Torah and perform God's mitzvot, we're able to, in essence, take him. It's an amazing concept. Usually, in the, especially in the Western world, in the Western world of academia, I'm over here and whatever it is I'm studying is over there. I don't have to internalize it. I don't have to really internalize it. I do need to appreciate it. I do need to understand it. And I may even be expected to master it, but not necessarily to internalize it. When I am learning Torah, I'm internalizing. My soul is drinking from the wellspring of living waters. That's how we see the spiritual practice of Talmud Torah. So turning the page, there's a verse 
There's a verse in Exodus that the Zohar comments on. I'm going to share it with you. It is magnificent. Let me see what time it is. Oh, gosh. Okay, so the verse is in Exodus 25.2. It basically says, God is commanding Moshe to, re, to tell all of us chuma, that they shall take for me an offering. The words, and they shall take for me, says the Zohar, actually means, and they shall take me to take God. The Zohar interprets the word truma, which we translate as an offering, as referring to the Torah because the word truma can be broken up into Torah with the letter M. The letter M in Gematria is 40. And Moshe was up on Har Sinai for 40 days receiving the Torah. So therefore it alludes to the Torah that was given after Moshe's 40 day sojourn on the mountain. Hence, the so what is the text really saying? That they shall take me, and it should have said, and Torah, if truma equals Torah, and the Zohar says it really means me, the verse should have said, and this is what rabbis love to do, they love to see what looks like it could be a mistake, but of course it's not a mistake, and figuring out why it's not a mistake is the actual learning of the Torah. So therefore, the verse the Zohar is suggesting really should have said, they can take, they will take me, and an offering, v, but it doesn't. Since me refers to God and an offering refers to Torah, it would seem more appropriate for the verse to state, you shall take me and Torah. But since it is by means of the Torah that the Jew takes me, except that both are one and the same, God and the Torah are truly one. So do you see that? Do you see and they shall take me is the same as Torah. Were the verse to state me and an offering equals Torah, we might be led to believe that the two are separate entities, which they are not, when in truth they are truly one and the same. So he continues and he says, I'm going to really just stick with the English because I already see that it's, uh, it, I'm into this a half hour. Let me see if there's any questions. I see, is, are any hands raised? On that note, if you'd like to be able, I'd like to be okay. Okay, great. Um, so to continue, this is the meaning of what we recite. Now there are two verses that we recite in two different prayers. One is during the silent prayer during the three holidays coming up, Pesach, Shavuot, and then Sukkot. And one, we every time we dive in the silent prayer, when we say Sim Shalom, which is the last final bracha. There are two phrases that sensitize us to this personal, intimate, close connection with God, that God is not just a theology. God is not such like this transcendental idea out there, but it's our God, which remember was given to us as a gift through the Torah, because we just learned from the Zohar's understanding that receiving the Torah is like receiving God, him herself. So this is the meaning of what we recite. And you have given to us, O Lord, our God with love. So for those who daven in Hebrew, and if you pray in the English, the prayer, the silent prayer for upcoming for Pesach, you'll recite that. And we also say when we conclude during the week on Shabbat with the Sim Shalom, Ki Bo'or Panecha Natatalanu Adonai Eloheinu. It's beautiful. For by the light of your countenance have you given us, O Lord, our God. Again, our God. It's like saying, our children, our parents, our best friend, our well, my husband, my wife, our community. That means there's a connection there. I once met a rabbinical, not a rabbinical, a student in the uh, in the in a, a Christian theology in the Christian um, theology school of divinity, and we were talking about God. <laughs> what what are we going to talk about? Right, we'll talk about God. 
And he said, I find it remarkable the way you talk about God, as if you're really in a relationship with God. God is not, is, this is more, Judaism is not just a theology for you. This is, I'm seeing that you're really in a, you're talking about God as if God is right with you. I said, and you, and it's not that with you? you know, how does a Jew respond? We ask a question. This is what this person in a divinity school, one of the division, one of the schools of Protestant, and I'm not, I don't remember, it was a long time ago, but he was so struck by my comfort of feeling close. I said, don't think I always feel close. I have my moments like in any relationship, right? But here we say two prayers that directly talk to that. Therefore, since this unity with God and the gift we have received that he is our God is not dependent on our spiritual service. I don't have to be an Avraham or Sarah. I don't have to be a Yitzchak or Rivka. Since the Torah was given to me at Har Sinai and I've received it, I'm receiving this as a gift, as an inheritance. Therefore, it's not dependent on my spiritual service. It is within the province of every single Jew. Every single Jew. Isn't that incredible? You don't have to be ultra-Orthodox. You don't have to proclaim to really believe in God without ever having a doubt. By the way, I don't even know if that's really possible. I don't know how one can live in this world and never experience doubt if one truly believes in God. But what he's saying here is you don't have to be anybody but you. You are liberated. You are free. You are redeemed to be truly who you are. And you can claim a piece of this for you, this relationship. It's not dependent on our spiritual service. It is within the province of every Jew. Were this level achieved only through one spiritual service, it would be correct to say that not everyone has yet reached this lofty level of unity where, whereby God becomes his God. So how can we say in our prayers? How can everyone have in our prayers our God if it weren't for that this is the gift? This is the gift. Since, however, we are granted this level as an inheritance and a gift, it applies to all Jews equally. For a bequest and a gift have nothing to do with the status of the recipient. Should a person be a rightful heir, the person inherits no matter what the person's standing is. Should a benefactor decide to shower his or her benevolence upon an individual, that individual is a valid recipient, no matter how undeserving he or she may be. Since this unity is equally attainable by all Jews, therefore nothing stands in the way of the soul's unity with God and God's light. And we refer to Torah as Torah or that the Torah is light. There's only one way. There's only one obstacle to this. Will. If we do not will it, it won't happen. If we will it, it will. And the Talmud talks about the power of will. When we will, because if a person, God forbid, doesn't want to be close with God, the person will not sense closeness with God. But immediately, when the person does so desire and accepts and draws upon oneself godliness and declares Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. This is why it's the most important statement in the entire Bible. Do you know that people have gone to their graves in the Holocaust? They've had to, they would, that, I, I can't imagine having this amount of faith to be forced to dig your own grave and right before they were shot, they would sing Shema. It's even a tradition today. You, God forbid, you're, you're in the hospital, the person's not well, and they can feel that they're not going to be here for much longer. 
It's a tradition to try to say at the very last moment that the soul is still in the body in this world, Shema Yisrael. To leave this world feeling I'm united, I'm close. This is a coming out of Egypt. Spiritually, spiritually, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Then surely the soul is spontaneously absorbed into God's unity. You just have to want it. You just have to want it with whatever spiritual baggage you bring to the conversation. We all have it. We all have our spiritual. We have a history. We all have life experiences. God is not asking for anything more than to be honest. Say, God, I want to be with you. I'm stuck. I feel I'm enslaved by these spiritual, emotional, mental taskmasters. And God is saying, do you really want to get out of Egypt? Just say, I'm one with you. And then learn about it later. A spirit, there's a beautiful phrase from the Zohar, a spirit evokes spirit and awakening from above and draws forth and bestows spirit, evoking an added measure of spirituality so that the person is drawn to God and cleaves to God. All God is asking of us, each one of us in this room, is that we each say, I want to. I want to feel close. I want to feel united. I want to feel I'm part of something bigger than my ego. I want to feel I'm part of something that has, in, that has meaning. A legacy I've inherited from my own history, my own people. And as a trustee, something I can give my children, the next generation, biological children or spiritual children, be it as it may. And this dynamic within the person's soul is a form of Yitziat Mitzrayim. This is an exodus from Egypt. You know, we say in Tehillim, in Psalms, maybe some of you have heard of this phrase, min hametza karatiya, from hametzar, from a narrow place. Metzar is the same word as Mitzrayim. So the whole country of Egypt is named after a narrow place. Min hametza karatiya, from a narrow place, I call out to you, God. Aneni b'merchavya, and God answers me from an expansive space. All God is asking us, of us, not to be the totally righteous, perfect person, not to have all the answers, never to have doubt. Be honest, be pure with your intentions. Do you want me in your life? Meaning, the life inside of us. Do you want to gain and have an encounter and gain access to the soul inside of you? All you have to do is will it and take my classes. <laughs> Had to add a little comedy here. Right? So this dynamic within the person's soul is a form of Yitziat Mitzrayim. The spiritual counterpart of the Exodus is the acceptance of the kingdom of heaven during the recitation of the Shema and one's desire to cleave to God and be united with God. For by these means, the soul frees itself from the exile. It's a terrible feeling. You know, today, in today's world, there's just a growing, it's a crisis. I mean, even pre-corona, I think corona's just exacerbated it, but the growing crisis of alienation from self, of loneliness, of disconnection, of exile, of galut. In Hebrew, it's the word galut. Well, I don't even know. Pardon me? Did someone say something? No, I guess not. Can, can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can. So therefore, it was, a, it was ordained that the paragraph concerning the exodus from Egypt be read specifically during the recital of the Shema. What do we say at the end of the Shema? As an adjunct to it, even though recalling and verbalizing the exodus is a commandment by itself, not pertaining to the commandment to recite the Shema, in the Talmud, in Masechet Brachot, and in the Shulchan Aruch and Arachayim, it, it really, it teaches us how we have to put the two together. 
saying Shema and concluding, meaning the full Shema, the three paragraphs, at the end, we talk about God taking us out of Egypt. Recalling the Exodus and the formal recitation of the Shema were placed together, for they are actually the same thing. Accepting the kingdom of heaven, the sovereignty of heaven during the Shema and the Exodus from Egypt are truly one, one and the same, since this acceptance is one's personal spiritual exodus, whereby the divine soul escapes the encumbrances of the body. What does the body say? You can't, you shouldn't, what if? Rather than, of course I can. I'm beckoned, I'm compelled, I have to. I need more meaning. I wanna be part of something bigger. So rather than be held back, we expand. So when we say the Shema, it's literally coming out of Egypt, which is why the codes enjoined us to say at the end of the Shema that the Lord our God took us out of Egypt. Likewise, the paragraph referring to the Exodus from Egypt, this third paragraph, how does it conclude? Ani Hashem Elokechem. I am the Lord your God. I belong, God is saying, I belong to you as much as you belong to me. This also accords with what has been explained earlier, that through the Exodus, one ensures that God becomes his or her personal God by achieving total unification with the divine. And I'm specifically referring here to the divine within the divine within our soul, the deeper part of ourselves. From the above, we realize that the exodus from Egypt is a daily event. How is that manifested? We say the Shema every day. We say that the Lord our God took us out of Egypt every day. So if that's what we say externally, what does it mean internally? Every day I can become closer. Look, I'm sure all of you have relationships that involve closeness. It could be all kinds of relationships. And I hope if they're healthy, close relationships that you're closer today than you were last week. And I hope that next week you'll be closer than now. That is the daily practice of why the Alter Rebbe added, not only b'chol davada, not only in each and every generation are we to experience this, but every single day, every single day. Hence, just as during the first historical exodus, God showed us his boundless love, obligating us to respond in kind. You know, when... <laughs> When someone loves you, uh, we respond with the love. I mean, that's healthy parenting when you raise a child. When a child feels loved, the child loves back. There's even a beautiful verse in Michelet in the book of Proverbs, Chavzayin Yudhet, 27, verse 19. Kamayim apanim lapanim ken lev adam la adam. Just as water mirrors the face to the face, likewise the heart from one person to another. So if I really feel that God loves me by giving me the wherewithal, intellectually, emotionally, mind, body, heart, soul, to be even better today than yesterday, to be more expanded today than yesterday, to feel more free than yesterday, and it comes from love, well, then I will love back even more. And that's the intimacy, spiritual intimacy with the divine. So too should the daily individual spiritual exodus affect us, since God constantly shows us his, her, its boundless love. More than anything, more than anything, hear what the Alter Rebbe is suggesting it's about love, which involves compassion, which involves so many beautiful midot, the refinement of so many midot, patience, giving people the benefit of the doubt, giving ourselves the benefit of the doubt, forgiveness, forgiving ourselves, forgiving each other. So contemplative practice, what we just did in the beginning, as an introduction, as a bringing us together, that's called contemplative practice. 
brings, manifests, reveals a Yitziat Mitzrayim. You can do this every day. Think about it for 60 seconds. In the beginning of the day, another 60 seconds at the end of the day, say the Shema in the morning, say the Shema at night. And what happened today that helped me become more connected to my soul, where I felt more free, more permitted, more allowed, more forgiving, more love, rather than limited. And you know, there's a phrase in the Zohar, it's not in this chapter, but there's a phrase in the Zohar that the Shekhinah, the divine presence does not reveal herself over a place that's separate. It's, spirit, it's a spiritual wound. So if I'm, all, if I'm all torn up inside, and that's how I am with people. This person's not religious enough. This person's too religious. This person's too old. This person's too young. They are far, too far to the right. They are too far to the left. They are not rich enough. They are not poor enough. What am, what am I doing? I'm actually putting myself more and more into Mitzrayim rather than coming out of Mitzrayim. And that's what the Zohar means that the Shekhinah will only reveal, reveal herself in a place of this with this connection, with this holding space for all the different others within me and all the different others around me. So before we move to the final piece, um, I want to open the room. We have a little time. Uh, yes, we have. A, I know I may have spoken a little fast. Maybe I got ahead of myself because I want to make sure to cover all the text. Let's take a few moments. If you have any questions on this text, now's a very good time to ask before we move to the concluding text. I see there are two people that chatted. So Jeff said, I think some of the morning liturgy after Shema that discusses God's words living and persisting for us and for our children, a similar concept, perhaps a challenge or an aspirational statement. I like that as an aspirational statement, something to aspire to. Thank you, Jeff. Right, that's so to the point. You know, the Sidor, I look at the Sidor as like when you go into an Asian restaurant and the Asian restaurants today like have a 35 page menu, you know, like Japanese, Chinese, vegan, sushi. It's filled with options. The Sidor is filled with options, aspirations. So the blessings before and after the Shema leading up to the Amidah, talk about love, something to aspire to. It doesn't mean I have to be it right now at 100%, but it's something I can reach towards. Thank you so much for that point. That's so important. Thank you. Lynn, Lynn, you raised your hand, please. Yes, Yiska. Um, I hope other people have the same struggle so that what I'm about to say isn't um, a waste of time, which is that, you know, for me, it's been difficult to kind of understand how to feel it here as opposed to just here. And this really fits in with something that I learned from one of your podcasts. I know it was from you. I forget who, whether it was the Alta Rebbe or maybe the Pizesna Rebbe that you were talking about that at moments in our normal, I'll call them non-spiritual lives, when we are feeling something very intensely great or maybe intensely painful or just are aware of a vulnerability, that that feeling is a really good segue into connecting with the divine. I know I learned that from you, I just don't remember who the teacher was that you were referencing, but this, what you're teaching us today really seems to fit in. It was probably the PS Etzner. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Th I mean, and, it, if, and... if that makes sense, and I hope it makes sense to other people if there are similar strugglers slash seekers out there. I don't know how one can be a seeker without struggling. And if one is truly struggling, it means that one is seeking. I really, I see them as entities that are very much aligned with each other rather than contradicting each other. And, and I, I've come to know you and I see you as both a seeker and a struggler. 
welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah. Is there anyone else? Raise your hand. You have a question, an insight. Let's see. I see some more people have chatted. Uh, how do? Oh, someone asked about accessing my podcast. So I will type in Yiska. www.yiskasmith.com. That's my website. Oh, I sent it to, I meant to send it, hold on one second to everyone. Okay. That's my website. You can, and, and at my website, you can then look under podcasts. And you, uh, I just released last week, the 38th in a long series. Next week, I'll be releasing another one. But yeah, that's how you can get my podcast. Authentic Jewish Living with Yiska. All right. So Perry said, I like the analogy of the walnut. Our skin is like the shell of the walnut. Our soul is the nut itself. Yes, Paul, uh, Perry. Maybe God's presence and Torah are similar. Torah is the physical presence or the shell. God's presence is the inside of the nut. I love that. I would like to add actually something to that, if I may, that the external observance of Torah which is very important, how we go about observing, how we go about learning, how we go about praying. You know, the codified prayer is more the shell, is more the protective covering, which then allows us to access the fruit inside, which is the experience of the mitzvah, the experience of the prayer, the experience of Talmud Torah, Actually, one of the pieces that I teach at Pardes is the spiritual, um, I see there's a student of mine in, in my current class in the room now, it'll be after Pesach, where I'll be sharing the spiritual practice of Talmud Torah through the lens of the P.S. Etzna Rebbe, that while it's an intellectual practice, it's also a spiritual practice. So we have this, anything in Jewish practice has an external and an internal the outer and the inner dimensions. All right. The Lubavitcher Rebbe once said, Maya is quoting, that a Jew's gashmiyut, mundane life, is also ruchniyut. Yes, yes. Recognizing that we can't have spirituality without the mundane, physical, and that means that the mundane is like a means to help reach a new spiritual level. You know, what is a body without a soul? Just a soul would be like an angel, but we're, we're not angels. We're human beings, and human beings were created with both for a reason. It's not an accident. It's with a very sacred, very beautiful purpose in mind. The notion that we put ourselves in Mitzrayim by limiting ourselves is so relevant to our political and social environment right now. Thank you for that. And yes, actually relevant to now, specifically the coming out or how anyone is sensing what's going on with Corona, with COVID, uh, it, it really has pressed, if I could use that word, imagine you're like between two walls and the walls are just caving and you feel pressed. Well, this allows us to gently and softly push those walls out, not letting external circumstances defining our realities. We are affected by the external realities. We take notice of external realities, but they don't define us. And to the contrary, the way we can spiritually, emotionally, and mentally respond to them as external realities very much softens the severity, sweetens the severity. It's the same pandemic, but you can see it through the lens of internal rather than external practice. Rather than fear, you can see it through trust, you can see it through so many different different lens that really speak to seeing life through the lens of spirituality. Okay, so I see we are ready to go to the uh, next piece. Fallon says the notion that we put ourselves in. Myth so yeah. Also, us, them, right, left, them. exactly, yes, yes, exactly. 
Thank you. Thank you for reminding us of that. Okay, we have a teaching from Rabbi Kalanimus Kalmish Shapira, otherwise known and more popularly as the Piyasetsna Rebbe, also referred to as the Eish Kodesh Rebbe since that was his last book. So just the way the Balatanya, Rav Shino Zaman of Laadi, is known as the Balatanya after his book, so the Piyasetsna Rebbe is also referred to as the Eish Kodesh after his uh, final book. He was born in 1889 in the suburb of Warsaw, in Piasetsna, therefore he's called the Piasetsna Rebbe, and he passed in 1943 when he was murdered in Trawinki concentration camp. He lived in the Warsaw Ghetto, survived the Warsaw Ghetto, he taught in the Warsaw Ghetto uh, from 1939 when it was, when it began, right when Germany invaded Poland, till after the uprising, which was around Pesach time of 1943, he survived all the different um, deportations to Treblinka, and he made it out and he was deported to Chorinki in, in April 1943, and then he passed uh, when he was murdered by a firing squad in November 1943. So he shares with us from his very first Sefer, Derech HaMelech, which is his commentary on the Chumash and the Chagim, which he wrote in Warsaw in the 1920s. After World War I, um, definitely before World War II. And he writes as follows. How long is this class? I forgot how long I have. Is it an hour and 10 minutes? Is that hour and 10 minutes? All right, so I have, I have 15 minutes. Okay. I would like to read the Hebrew. It's good to hear the Hebrew. I think it's important. It's not a lot. Uh, and I'll translate as I move. And I, I really ask you to open up here, to really open your hearts, because he's going to share something that every year when I relearn this, it's, it's, it's just, it's profound. It's absolutely profound. Lechen kol ish Yehudi tzarich. Therefore, meaning in light of everything I've just said, which is like pages and pages and pages, every Jewish person tzarich needs to feel within oneself, meaning in the heart, and to examine with one's mind, with one's intellect. Tamid, always. If he is present, if the person is present with oneself, with one's reality, with one's world. The as, if a person is present, this is a phrase from the Zohar. If this is the case, and only then when one is present, one can reach or rise to an increased level, an increased experience of transparency, of purity. It's an experience where a person will actually experience more of clarity when one is present. The Zohar says in Parshat Mishpatim, that in essence, it's a gift. Yahavin means to give. That by being more present, we will be given we will rise to the level of increased spiritual awareness and transparency. So when someone tells me, I, I don't think I'm so spiritual, I, I really don't know if I have a soul. I'm not so sure if I have a soul. I don't know what all this means. The question really is that I ask back, how present are you with you? How aware are you of you? What is it you're thinking? What is it you're feeling? You, not what other people think about you, but how aware are you of you? And as long as a person is not complete with one's presence, God forbid, the person is not able to really experience, 
to reach this level of increased transparency. That's why there's so much confusion in the world. Why are so many people confused? Because they either they were a step ahead or a step behind of themselves. That's what's beautiful about focusing on breath. You can't be behind or ahead of yourself. You can only be present. And this is what's alluded to in the Haggadah. Now he has a different understanding than the Alter Rebbe does. Meaning, what is a person chayav? What is a person obligated to do? It's where you put the comma is the interpretation. Instead of a person is obligated to see oneself as if he has come out of Mitzrayim, a person is obligated to see oneself. Pause. Chayav adam liot et atzmo. Each person is not only, not obligated to see oneself as if one came out of Egypt. Each person's obligated to see, to be present. If in fact the person is present with oneself. And if a person is, it's a ke'ilu. That for that person is, oh my gosh, I've come out of my own Mitzrayim. I have come out of my own Mitzrayim by being present. Because if a person is why are we spiritually in exile? I'm talking about a spiritual exile where a person is not present with oneself. It's in order to find parts of life that really one needs to discover so one can be present. This is the deeper, deeper, deeper meaning of galut. We're in Galut spiritually. You can live in Yerushalayim and be spiritually in Galut because we need to find another part of ourselves that we've lost because we're not present with it. So, kikala Galut hu im enonimsa because the whole meaning of spiritual Galut is if we're not present with ourselves. My mind is over here. My heart is over here. I really wish this, but I won't say that because what will they think of me? I'm all over. I'm anything but present. There's no transparency there. It's a total galut. I'm in my own Mitzrayim. So what he's saying, this is what we're obligated to practice, to see ourselves without judgment, without being better or worse, higher or lower. Just who am I? Who am I? You know, the ultimate existential question, who am I and why am I here? When we're present, all the answers will become revealed. All the answers will be, we were created to have clarity, to be present. And when we do, this is as if I have come out of Egypt. So I wanna put into the room, I wanna, I'm going to ask some questions that I believe the PSS is I want to unpack it a little more in the few more minutes we have together. How do you see yourselves? Invisible? Disappearing? Unseen by yourself, by others, by God? Or do you see you in a way that you are discovering parts of you? You see that you are found by you, that you are present, that Hashem sees you, that others see you. What he's saying here is, I need to be present, meaning I need to step into myself. I need to step into me, meaning not the ego me, not the part of me that's struggling always to survive, the bigger me, the higher me. I need to step into the source of my own transparency, my own purity, my soul, 
When I can do that, it's a ke'ilu. It's as if mamash, I'm literally no longer in galut. I'm no longer enslaved, but I'm actually coming into a space of redemption. It's pure, it's clear, it's transparent. This is what you can take to the Seder. You can take this to the Seder. When you get to this section, pause, pause. Who's ever leading the Seder, ask him, him or her, or maybe choose that piece to read. You can add the Alter Rebbe's words. This is what it means. This is a ke'ilu. This is a ke'ilu. Yatsami Mitzrayim. Seems that in Tanya we have unconditional love of Hashem with the Piyasesna. It is conditional on self reflection first. No, no, no. From Hashem's. Suzanne, thank you for asking that. From, from Hashem's point or perspective, Hashem always lo- Hashem is our spiritual parent. Hashem always loves us, always loves us. Are we aware of us loving Hashem? Are we aware that's a Yitziat Mitzrayim, that I'm aware of God loving me. God is always loving me, but am am I aware of it? And then when I'm aware of it, of course I will love back. Marilyn says, stepping into myself and redemption reminds me of the Israelites going into the sea, an act of faith. That's all, um, it's interesting, Marilyn, that that's the point you bring up because the Shvi Shel Pesach, the end of Pesach is when we really became free. You know, when we came out of Egypt the first day, we were not yet free. We were no longer enslaved. But as long as we were running away from, as long as the Egyptians were pursuing us, we were not free. It was only when we got to the other side of this, after the sea split, and the Egyptians, unfortunately, they had to drown. I mean, even God, so to speak, cried at the event in in the Midrash that his own creations had to drown. But because they drowned, they no longer could pursue us. And that's when we really, that was the fulfillment of Yitziat Mitzrayim. That was full transparency of being present. That was a real Ke'ilu moment. So Peter is saying, let's see, I'm wondering about the influence or the interaction between this teaching and his experience in the Shoah. Well, yes, that's so much testimony speaks of dehumanization and loss of identity. And I can't help but hear a resistance to that in this teaching. Well, I'll tell you, Peter, the Eish Kodesh and everyone else was his other bookend book. His first was Dera HaMelech, which this comes from. Ish Kodesh also was a commentary on the Chumash and on the Chagim, and it was his final book. And in fact, that's where he did push back against the darkness. He did resist. He he took this teaching from Dera HaMelech and tried to live it in the Warsaw Ghetto by being present with his suffering and his flocks, by being present with all the atrocities, he was actually able to be more freed rather than parodying theological high, very sophisticated words that really don't talk to people's souls when they're suffering. He really spoke to it. And in that way, he actually freed himself. It's really remarkable. It's another Sefer, Eish Kodesh. This comes from Dera HaMelech. Thank you for bringing that up. Very, very important, very important point. He was a spiritual revolutionary and he resisted against anything external defining him, even when it was horrific, horrific pain that was inflicted that caused suffering. He pushed back on it gently with softness with the spiritual words. 
and spiritual enlightenment and spiritual awareness. Okay, so before we conclude, does anyone have a last question? Raise your hand. Okay, um, a word from our sponsor. I just want to remind everyone that um, there's an upcoming webinar on Wednesday, March 17th, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. in Israel for anyone interested in learning more about next year's year program. And I believe the link was shared earlier. You, and also we have lots of upcoming opportunities for those who want to learn with us online that are not enrolled right now at Pardes. We have the Pardes Daily Passover Challenge, which is happening right now. And in a more immersive way, we have a two week online summer session coming up. Just go to our website, www.pardes.org.il slash summer to find out about that. All right, so I wanna wish you, I, I really wanna wish you all, not just a, we, you know, we have the typical greeting and it's a beautiful greeting, Chag Pesach Kasheva Sameach. May you have a kosher and a joy-filled uh, Pesach. I do wish that for all of you, but I also really, really want to bless all of you with a Pesach that you really feel deep within where you are compelled, mamash, to see yourselves, to really be present with whomever you are. And really, how bad can any of us be? We're created in the image of the creator. My gosh, look who's look whose image we're creating. You know, we have a physical DNA of our biological mother and father. That alone is beautiful. You know, I mean, my blue eyes, right? I got from my father, that's wonderful. But the spiritual DNA, we all equally inherited such wonderful spiritual DNA. So really, I bless you, mamash, be, feel the inner calling to see yourself. And then it will be a ke'ilu yitzami mitzrayim. Thank you very much. Kol tuv, 